The breath is the basis of our practice. Partly because it's our anchor in the present moment. And partly because it's the means by which we shape our experience of the body. And the way we do that, if we do it in ignorance, is going to cause suffering. So we bring the other factors that shape our experience, our ways of directing our thoughts to a topic and evaluating it. We apply that to the breath in a way that gives rise to the way we shape the mind through feelings and perceptions. In other words, we have labels we place on the breath and we have perceptions and they tell us this is a breath sensation or that may not be a breath sensation, and you work with those. How can you work it so that everything in the body is related to the breath in your perceptions? And breathe in a way that gives rise to feelings of pleasure and ease. A sense of rapture when you need extra energy, and a sense of equanimity when you want their energy level to calm down. You bring all these things together with the breath. Because these are the various ways we shape our experience, and if we do any of them in ignorance, there's going to be suffering. So we try to do this with knowledge, awareness, clear awareness. Now the clarity of our awareness and our skill in shaping these things together is something that's going to have to develop over time. And it's through observing these processes that we gain discernment. I was reading a while back uh, an interview in which a teacher was talking with a student. A student said that she had been meditating on her breath and found there was a fair amount of pain in her body. And so she adjusted the level of her breath, adjusted the way she breathed. And it alleviated a lot of the pain, made it easier for sit long periods of time. And the teacher said, well, that's all well and good, but you lost an opportunity to gain discernment. That's a real misunderstanding right there. Because how are you going to gain discernment unless you look into this process of what the Buddha calls fabrication? Have we fabricate our sense of who we are and where we are, what the body's like? You have to learn to play with these things if you're going to gain any discernment at all, to understand what fabrication is and what effect cause and effect cause and excuse me effect has when you manipulate certain causes what are the effects that come about to what extent can you create a, a reliable sense of ease and well-being through the breath to what extent do you run into barriers you run into the limits of what a fabricated happiness can be the only way you're going to learn these things is through playing with them it's like getting a new toy or getting a new stereo system. You play with the dials, you play with the different settings, and you learn how far you can go with that particular toy or that particular stereo. That's the same with the breath and the way you relate to the body. This is what the Buddha calls pleasant practice. Getting the mind to settle down with a sense of ease, creating sensations, creating feelings in the body through the breath that draw you into the present moment that make you like staying here. This is one way that we practice, but it's not the only way. If it were the only way, we'd be really limited. All our defilements would be able to hide in whatever blind spots we might still have. This is why the Buddha said there's also painful practice. And it's interesting, when he talks about painful practice, it's not physical pain. Although learning how to sit with pain is an important lesson in patience. In fact, it's one of the very beginning lessons in meditation. You sit in the meditation posture for long enough, and it's going to give rise to pain. Your ability to deal with pain comes under the the qualities of patience and equanimity, which the Buddha takes as a preliminary for all types of meditation. 
But then on top of that, he says there's another kind of painful practice, and that's contemplating the unattractiveness of the body. And this is really important, because we're all attached to the body in one way or another, and that becomes a big weight on the mind. And the extent to which we don't see that as a problem, that in itself is a problem. As the Buddha said, if you have a lot of passion, a lot of aversion, a lot of delusion, you really do have to look into this issue of how you're attached to the body. And one way of counteracting the attachment is to start thinking about all the unattractive and undesirable things that there are in your body. This is not to make you hate the body. It's not meant to induce desires to, to die or anything like that. It's just medicine for the fact that we're strongly attached to the body, and that attachment is a big weight on the mind. There's an interesting story in the canon of a nun who's going out in the forest, and she meets up with this guy who propositions her. Now, he's not a crude guy. There's a version of the story that I was reading a while back. You know, these renderings they do when they don't really translate straight, in which he comes off, he, <coughs> excuse me, which he comes off as a real oaf. And of course, she's going to say no. But in the original version, he's very articulate, and he spins all kinds of word nets to try to trap her in one way or another. All the pleasures he's going to provide for her, all the wealth he's going to be able to give her if she will go off with him. Now, she's not the least bit interested. She's a non-returner. And she goes on and on and on about how pleasant it is in the forest, if you, it would be in the forest if they went together. And how beautiful she is. Now, for anyone who's a, who worries about how beautiful his or her body is, that's a real trap right there, because you're constantly concerned. Does this person think I'm beautiful? Does that person think I'm beautiful? But fortunately, she didn't have any interest in that, because as she told him, there's nothing in this body that's attractive. It's all ready to die. You take, take the contents out, and you wouldn't want to look at them at all. Why are you, why are you interested in this body? He says, because of your eyes. He goes on and on how be beautiful her eyes are, like the eyes of a doe. And she says, what is an eye? It's just a little bubble filled with tears and secretions and everything. But if you like my eye, here have it. She plucks it out, hands it to him. Of course, that puts an end to his attempts at seduction. He apologizes profusely. And she goes safely along her way. Now notice that she goes safely on her way as a result of this. She saved herself from the nets and traps that he's laying with his words. And when you think about it, she had quite a sense of humor. You like my eye? Okay, have it. That's a mind with a lot of freedom. The story ends that she goes to see the Buddha, and just looking at the Buddha, she gets her eye back. There's some question whether the story actually happened. But it tells you an important lesson, that when you're not attached to the body, you, the mind is free, and you're not trapped in the kinds of traps that everybody lays out for people who are, who are, who are attached to their bodies and are concerned about. Does my body look beautiful to other people? Do I look strong? How do other people think about my body? That's a huge trap. And if you've swallowed the, the lines of society that want, want you to be attached to your body and concerned about that kind of thing, then you're really trapped. And so learn to see this practice of contemplating the unattractiveness of the body as a means for freedom. The mind is light. Your mind is able to do a lot of things it wouldn't be able to do if it was worried about the body all the time. And one of the reasons why people don't want to put in extra hours of practice is they're afraid that they It'll hurt their health, or it'll be bad for this or bad for that in terms of the body. You say, wait a minute, the body's going to die anyhow. Let me get the best use out of it while I've got it. Rather than spending your time shoring up this sandcastle that's just melting away in the waves. And you look after the body, take care of it as you need in order to practice. But don't let your attachment to the body get in the way of the practice. 
and the extent to which you make excuses for yourself by saying, well, this, this type of meditation is really not the one that I need. You have to look into that objection, because there's a lot of attachment in there. So when the time is appropriate, you look at the, the body the way you, you would the way they eat mangoes in the Philippines. They basically take the mango and turn it inside out. And think of it if you took the mouth and just pulled in everything in the body, inside the body, out the mouth, and had the sack exposed from the other side. You couldn't look at it at all. It's the stuff we're walking around with all the time. Now, how can we be concerned about whether it's good looking or not, or whether it's attractive or not? That's the whole purpose of this contemplation is to get to the point where the mind is neither taken with attractiveness or unattractiveness. You realize that these are perceptions that you apply that are not all that useful. And when you can get past them, the mind is freed from a lot of concerns and a lot of worries. So this is a method of practice that's really important. Now, it's not pleasant. As the Buddha said, it is a painful practice because it goes against the grain. But you find that there are times when giving the mind what it wants in terms of pleasant sensations to the breath can't get it to settle down. And yet when you chastise it with this, the contemplation of the body, it behaves itself. And John Mahabhu has the image of sometimes the practice is like a stick. Some of the Buddha's teachings are like the stick that you use to make sure a monkey doesn't grab this or grab that. As soon as it grabs something, you hit its hand with a stick, and the monkey's going to sit very still. Or you can compare it with the issue of the carrot and the stick. There's sometimes when the donkey needs the carrot in order to go, and other times you need to give it a taste of the stick. So this is one of the things you've got to learn when you look after your own practice. One of the times when the mind needs something pleasant, something soothing, something reassuring in order to settle down. When do you have to get strict with it? Point out its, its shortcomings. Point out its failings. Point out its foolish attachments. Realize that the mind is going to need both types of treatment. And a lot of the skill in meditation is learning how to figure out which treatment you need right now. 